right. So this is the third in my series, the payback series. And uh, tonight I'm chatting to James McMahon. Let's see if I can find him. Look at me, a musician who is very, very, very punctual. And the interviewer is late. Bear with. We'll keep waiting. While I'm waiting, I'm going to so sup on this. Some local Kent sparkling wine. I recommend it highly. Yeah. Oh, connecting. Score! Hello, mate. How you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. My uh, my guinea pigs chose about five minutes ago to start fighting. This is what I was gonna I was gonna open with. So I hear you've got some lockdown pets. Hang on. So you've got these you've got these two guinea pigs, but you've yeah. got them you got them knowing you were going into lockdown, or you were already contemplating getting two little furry fellas. Well, I've been banging on about the guinea pigs for years, and uh, my missus has been like, "No, we can't have them. It's it's hard enough looking after you." And then. <laughs> Probably about, uh, like, I've been, like, so with the whole lockdown thing, like, I've got, like, two weeks and everyone else, because I just shut down, like, I was hyper-paranoid. So, like, just when, uh, and, like, to the extent of, like, my missus, who's, like, super sensible, you know her, her name's Catherine. She, um, you know, like, she was, like, going, when do you go to football with your mates? And I'm going, what are you on about? Like, next you'll be suggesting I go to Cheltenham Festival, like, <laughs> you know, just, I was just trying to shut down. And just as the lockdown happened, she was like, oh, listen, I need to let you know I've got some guinea pigs. And I just, I mean, it was just the most amazing. You know, you know when you love someone and then there's like another tidal wave of love that kind of crashes in upon it. Uh, and this guy turned up about an hour later. He made a hutch uh, with his daughters. His daughters had to give their guinea pigs away because their landlord oh. didn't have them. Oh, no. But, so that was a bit traumatic. You know, they're, they're crying. Like, no, a little bit, daddy, yeah. No. A little bit. A little bit like, you know, kind of, you know, do you want a moment before we <laughs> com complete the transaction? But they, they were all right. Uh, but they didn't tell us that they absolutely hate each other. So it's sort of been like two months of like loving them, but not understanding why they don't love each other like we love them. And you, are they like, are they the same sex? The two boys, yeah, obviously. So does, or, or otherwise you'd have a, a whole bunch of them. But well, actually... yeah, yeah, but the, the two boys, obviously that's why they're behaving terribly. Oh, you know, because but, you, like people recommend that you get two women, you see. See, because women, women, they're just better. They would just it, like two women would just bitch about each other behind their behind their backs, you know. Like the boys that, are. That's a myth. That's not what we do. We're very straight with each other. I remember, Bullshit. I remember school. I remember school. So I'm going to start with the thank you for doing this, by the way. No worries. Um. Can you remember when um when we when my boyfriend reminded me about this today when I first met you in real life and I was proper fangirling you? Was that at the festival? Yeah, because I'd been a, I'd been a fan of your of your work for years. Like I I love music journalism. It's one of the reasons I got into music, and um, well, yeah, yeah. And I've been reading your stuff for years. So when I finally met you. I was kind of, I like, had sweaty palms. I was like, oh, yeah, it's really bad. So even now, this still, for me, it's a big deal. So thank you very much for being here. I mean, I, I, am, a, I am a big fan of people who are like... A big fan of you. I mean, I, the next question is normally what's wrong with you, but I am a big fan of people who are fans of just really inconsequential people. Like, I, like, there's loads of musicians I love that, like, I can categorically say nobody loves. <laughs> you know, like, I, like I've met musicians before, I'd be like, you're one of the greatest songs, and I'd be like, 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 what? Like, I love that, you know, like, I think it's amazing. It's like, I don't know, you guy from the 1975, he gets all the love, right? What yeah. About other, what about the other boys and girls, you know? I, I agree. But I mean, so why did you, why music journalism? Why did you want to be a music journalist, and, and how did you get into it? So I am from Doncaster. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> good eyebrows. Uh, I'm from Doncaster in Yorkshire, and I uh, kind of found music sort of 13, 14. Um, and then I think I found my way to Nirvana. 
and then Kirk Bain dies, and then I was so wanted to read and consume everything to do with Nirvana Kirk Bain. Um, started buying music magazines because he was on the cover and it was, you know, tribute issues and what's not. And I think I found, I just, it's really hard to explain how I found the enemy at that point. Like, it was just, like, it was as important to me as Nirvana were. You know, like, you know, people talk about that kind of road to Damascus. Like, oh my God, this is everything in my life makes sense. Like, the enemy made me feel like that. Um, it's kind of gets a bit kind of a bit more complicated than that because I kind of go off and after that I got really into fanzines and kind of like underground press and a lot of that stuff was really at odds with like you know kind of loving the enemy but for the, for my teenage years like you know Johnny Cigarettes, Stephen Wells, like John Mulvey, like all those people were just I don't want to say gods because I kind of saw them in a more like familiar way than that but they were like. They they spoke to me in a way that no one else in my life did, and I just it's weird as well because I'm very much at a point in my life now where, you know, I kind of like to think of myself as a journalist. I kind of you know do yeah. lots, lots of different things, but the story is always for 15 years. It's, I don't want to be a journalist. I want to be an enemy writer. You know, it's like I don't know, and it's funny. It's like um, you know, friends with a lot of people who kind of grew, who are older than me who grew up feeling the same about the Melly Maker and. You know, even even now they're like, oh, you know, the Melly Maker was a different beast to the Enemy, but and you know, I kind of totally relate to that. But like, Enemy is really the kind of the love that I've never really been able to kick. Even was that now. your? What was that your first job that you got in music journal? Because I'm going to focus, if you don't mind, if I focus solely on your mu your career as a music journalist, was that your first um, your mm. first paid job? Your first job as a music journalist? Well, I because um, I was up in Newcastle. What? So, you know all this. I'm pretending I don't. Oh, right, okay, right. right. <laughs> what? Okay, okay, sorry. I forgot the sort of the Frost Nixon dynamic that's going yeah, on. Yeah, here. yeah, 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 uh, yeah. So I, went, so I went to University in Sunderland, and that was when I was 18. That's not Newcastle. Well, no, I'm getting there. Like, all right. So I was at university for, I mean, some, I mean, apologies to any Geordies, but Sunderland's the better of the two. But Someone didn't have a cinema at the time, so I kind of moved to Biker instead. Yeah. But, so I moved to Newcastle after university, and I was... I mean, it was just stupid. It's like people who want to write for the music press, they don't go further north. They go down south. But I was like... I was like... Um, I don't know, it's weird. It's like I'm really insecure about so many things in my life, and there's so many things I don't think I'm very good at, and beat myself up about but I've never questioned that I was like a good writer like I've never questioned that you know almost almost in my mind the enemy would knock on my door one day you know like so I didn't send reviews or like you know there were people who I were at university with who were obsessed with being music writers and they had all these really kind of warped views on how to do that like um you know almost like I guess if you're in a band and you're going this is how you get your demo to so and so like it was like that and I was just going nah man like don't don't just ring me up Cool. And that's kind of what happened, you know, like, they did just get in touch. But so I was in Newcastle freelancing, working for Northumbria University in the entertainment department, basically uh, getting clean towels for bands, which was weird when you'd kind of written about them the week before and they'd kind of turn up and they'd be like, oh, thanks for the towels. And I'd be like, oh, I wrote your album review last week. And that was a bit weird. And then when I was like 25, so I've been like freelancing for about four years, I was just so frustrated that I wasn't doing more, that I just moved to London. And there was like a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in like four or five years and just went kind of sleep on your floor and just, I was like, I'm going to be in London until I get a job at the NME. And I just went in there every day to the extent that they're like going back again. You know, <laughs> like it was like, and I just stuck around so I got a job and like that's, you know, that's kind of how it works out. There's a bit kind of in between now. I, did, I went to work for Metal Hammer for a while. Um, What's because... Metal Hammer? What is Metal Hammer? Uh -huh. we, we, okay, so Metal Hammer is a big rock magazine. It's a big heavy for, metal magazine. For those that don't know, well, I, see, I've always been a bit. I've always been the boy that loved, you know, Ben Sebastian and Slayer, kind of in equal measure. So there's yeah. always there's always been a bit of that, you know what I mean? So um, I went to write for Metal Hammer for a year, and it was good because I got to see all of Scandinavia because all of the best metal bands are from. Scandinavia. Yeah. What are you doing this weekend, James? I'm off to Finland. What are you doing this weekend, James? I'm off to Norway. And Norway, then, man. Norway. And then 
I and it kind of also I think made the enemy go, all right, we should probably hurry up and give him a job. So yeah, but enemy was enemy is like kind of the first my, my first staff job. And you were at the enemy for ten years. Is that yeah, right? Like, ten years. Yeah, like there was a, there was a degree that was freelance, but and the then was... and then from the enemy you went to Kerrang, right? No, I went to uh, I left the enemy uh, when I was thirty because I was mental. Uh, <laughs> kind of we really all get it. Hey? We all get it. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, yeah. Went, I went off to uh, work for a video games magazine in Bath. And uh, that was not the place to go when, you know, you're mental. Uh, no offence to Bath, but, you know, it's quite quiet and boring and Yes. And I, I went and did that for a couple of months, but I applied. I'd applied for the, the editor's job at Kerrang, maybe six months before that. They'd taken someone else on. They hadn't worked out, and then they rang me up. So my entire time in Bath, living with Lily Allen's mother-in-law. What? Yeah. <laughs> Who was so, her mother-in-law? I can't even remember her name. You know. Oh, I thought it'd be like someone famous. Still, Lily Allen's mother-in-law. No, she was. Cool. She was. She was famous. Oh. She was married to. Um, God, she's married to the bloke from Protocol Harlem. Yeah. And he and the house was like done up with like uh, photos everywhere and and she was really nice and everything, but I, I'd known Lily a bit from NME and I went on Twitter one day, back when Twitter was nice and you could do this kind of thing. And I was like, I'm moving to Bath. Ah and Lily was like, Oh, my mother in law's got a spare room, so I went and lived with her. Go cool. on. But it was so weird because I was like, basically, I and mean, this is like a Craig David song, but I was like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, mental. Thursday, play a few video games. Friday, go out for dinner with Lily Allen. And then start the week again, you know. It was like, it was a really weird time. But the whole time was basically working my nose to come back to London and do Quran. Can I, so speak, speaking of Twitter, do you, do you mind me asking about, it was like, do you know what I'm going to ask you? No, <laughs> about, no, 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 About, it was that time, no, no, no. and it was, a, if you don't, by the way, if I ask anything, you don't want to answer. No, 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 no it's fine, it's fine. Um, it was that time, it was like, in, because I actually, I want to talk to you about, about alternative culture. Right. And, but then, little side note to that, being in 2013, there was that time, I think you were editor of Kerrang! at the time, and you would you'd put up a few tweets, and I'm going to quote a few. I I mean I thought that I remember reading them at the time, and I thought they were brilliant. And I agree okay. with you. And I know you got a massive backlash afterwards, but there were certain things, and I think you're kind of talking about alternative culture. Yeah. And you write, it's not a Twitter rant. It's just some statements. Okay. Um, you wrote things like sick of dudes in bands that look like Primark models or handsome okay. plumbers. More freaks, please. And uh, another one of my personal favourites being, basically, if you weren't bullied at school, you shouldn't be allowed to pick up a guitar and form a band. I mean, that was bad times. <laughs> but I, mean, I know, but, but it's just that... I, I know it's bad times, but I mean... That you one, got you that gone one, with that. That one. Was I know. But it's no, just... like, I don't know. Like, I found, actually... I mean, I found that it, it's sort of that juxtaposition that I never really... It's that juxtaposition between being like, hey, I'm a writer with opinions, and hey, I'm this person who has to get along with everyone and steer a music magazine, like, through the rocky world of exclusives. And, you know, I never really ever, ever got to terms with that. Like, I, you know, like, all that stuff I think, you know, I mean, frivolously, you know, of course, of course you shouldn't have to, you know, show how much pocket money has been taken from you before you're allowed to form a band. But, like, loosely speaking, like, I want the people who make music to be, you know, strange and have unique experiences and, and have a different kind of voice to anyone else. Um, but, ah, there's not a lot of nuance on Twitter, is there? So... Yeah, but that's... I mean, does... Um, well, I guess, yeah. But do you feel like... With, with, with kind of what you were saying there, do you kind of feel like alternative culture's been, like, hijacked almost i mean i sort of feel like that happened even before i was an adult like yeah i sort of feel even like you know living through like brit pop it was like you know i mean I, I really love football but it was like the, like it was like the football lads won you know like i mean even my friend like luke our friend lucas you know like i was talking to him the other day about uh stone roses and he was like oh, i hate the stone roses at the time because 
you know, they were like the boys that used to, you know, give me aggro at school and like all of a sudden yeah. they were in the nightclub and asking them to put stone roses on when I was enjoying the cure or whatever. Yeah. I don't know, I sort of I don't know, it's weird, it's like I'm not I don't know. Part of me was just about to say, I think, think feels that think, I feel like things have got slightly better. But then, you know, one of my big concerns these days is like, where are the working class voices? Yes. Because it's like, it's almost like impossible to be in a band anymore. Because yeah. how how do you do that without the doll? How do you do that without you know trust funds or whatever? So yeah, I've just noticed that we are scientists have gone on live right now. I might go watch them. Way. No, no, don't do the stay, stay put. I thought don't, you meant they were watching us. I was like, no, oh, no, 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 no. They're, All right, they're obviously okay. not got the memo. Anyway, but do you feel like, I understand what you're saying about, especially there being a real lack of working class voices. I'm often, people assume because of my accent and that I'm from kind of Sunderland, right. people assume I'm from a working class background. I've never once said that and I'm not. I just have this accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do speak out about it a lot and say that no, there is a void of these voices because like, I had financial, I had uh, financial help from my parents to move to London and all the rest of it. I had the help to do it. And so it's really important that you say that. And I think it's important that we speak about that a lot more. But like, do you find that, I, I always wonder with you lot, music journalists, I wonder if it's like a frustrating time for you lot because, and I've asked other people this as well, what's your take on it? But because like there is this thing with social media where it's like, if you write anything, I think loads of artists feel kind of scared to say things like they're policing their thoughts because they're worried about the backlash or what people might say. And so as a journalist, and you were saying before about, you know, wanting these kind of, I don't know what you said earlier, not eccentric characters, but you know, the weirdos and stuff. But do you find that it's kind of frustrating for you as a journalist because you're finding that people, artists and bands that you're interviewing, they're much more guarded maybe because of that fear of a backlash on Twitter or whatever. There was definitely an incident with the guinea pigs at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what, I wonder what they think about it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it got a, uh, like I never ever want to be one of these, like, you know, political correctness, you know, gone mad people because, you know, like it's really important to like seek out, <laughs> It's really important, you know, things like visibility and privilege and all these things that we really, I think, will look back on our world in, t you know, in five years' time and go, you know what, like, we did, we did make that fairer, you know, and it was like a bloody battle doing it. Like, I, I totally believe in all that stuff. But at the same time, I also think that people are really nuanced, rounded, um, like, flawed entities. And yeah. Some of my favourite people have done stupid things, and some of my, you know, I'm. I was always saying my mates, like, I'm really suspicious of nice people. Like, nice isn't a default position for people to be. Like, the nicest people I know are some of the not nicest people I've ever met. Secret, sense, secret you know? serial killers. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, Ted Bundy, man. You know what I mean? He was nice, <laughs> wasn't he? He was professional. Um, Oh, we talk about true crime, which is, of course, my other look. No, we're not allowed. We're not allowed. I know okay. that you've got another foray into true crime and, no, and this no, being no, no. not allowed. But no, like, this... um, I think that I have to say, and this is weird, this is a weird thing for me to say, but yeah. when else would I ever get to say this? So, I, I kind of hated Twitter for ages. I was like, I had this real, I had this real dream when I started Karang that, I could almost create a magazine that was like made by the people who read it. You know, like I really wanted to like kind of almost like they were this extended ed editorial team and they would tell me what they wanted. And I kind of think to an extent that kind of happened and it was good. And, you know, even now, like I've, I've left that magazine like two and a half years ago, but even now you hear from people that are like, oh, I love the magazine that you made. It's brilliant. It's so inclusive. And that's, that was really what it's supposed to be. I also like have, like crippling OCD and Twitter kind of became a bit of a crutch for that. Like I think something I'm going to say it or like I'm worried and concerned about something. I need some instant validation. I'm going to say it. Yeah. So sometimes like when you were like, I'm going to read some out, I'm a bit like, Oh God, I really hope that wasn't the summer of 2014. That was a bad one. <laughs> oh, I missed that. Mean? Yeah, exactly. But like, yeah, that was, that's my sort of bit of a quantifier really. And I also just think as well, like if you're, if you're a total, I don't want to say freaks and weirdos because those terms are a bit loaded, but like, you're probably not on Twitter. You know, like, 
I, I've got a bit of a thing these days that when I the, some of the best stuff I feel like I do, the best creative things I do, I kind of forget Twitter even exists. You know, like I'm gone for like five days and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going, I'm going to go and have a row with someone now. But you know, those four or five days are like, you know, really where the good stuff happens. It's a really healthy way to look at it. But there is, I mean, you just mentioned there your OCD, and um, there's I only read it uh, yesterday. I wasn't aware of this article and I was doing my last minute research. I was like, I know, I need to more stuff. And um, I stumbled upon and I didn't see it at the time. I'm sorry, mate, but it's, I'm, really gl- I'm really glad that I did. It's an article that you wrote for The Independent, like early April, just gone. Oh, recently, yeah. And it's titled, How a New Generation of Musicians Are Confronting OCD. And, and it's, um, I mean, firstly, like, I just want to commend you on doing it. But it's also... I'll take the credit I, for that. Yeah, but it's, it, it's, you're talking about visibility so much. And also, like, I'm interviewing so many, this whole series is about interviewing music journalists. And I was, I'm really, really glad to get the opportunity to talk to yourself because we, we can talk about this subject also, but it's a thing where, like, you, it, it's like, it feels like you've got, it's like two of your worlds colliding, you know, like your passion for music journalism and your life uh, with OCD. And also, mm-hmm. as a person who speaks about and the passion about speaking about it, yeah, it's really interesting. So, can you tell us a little bit about about that article? I mean, I sort of feel like, I mean, it's a weird thing. Like, you know, I'm freelance now. I've been freelance for a couple of years, and like, yeah. I, I still would probably say so. I'm very much in a phase of working out what I do now. Like, that, that's how I feel. You know, like, um, both big staff jobs that I had, like Enemy and Koran, they. Like, they both, you know, 10 years, six years, like they both ended with me not being very well, like because of my OCD. And like, I, weirdly, I've been kind of freelancing for two and a half years, but it's only really been a year and a half because it was a really bad year there. Um, I kind of feel a little bit like with OCD, it's like, it's such a, it's such a misunderstood, debilitating illness that it's like, I personally find it hard to exist without it almost being at the forefront of my personality. Like, I hate that because it isn't what I am and it isn't, you know, what I want to be. And I would do anything to have never had this happen to me, never have my brain kind of, you know, forge in this, you know, messed up cognitive way. But I feel like, I feel, I find it really hard not to have it almost like at the forefront of kind of what I do. So it's like, not that it's like a disclaimer, but it's almost like, listen, I'm working against this, you know, like, and also the big thing is, is that when I was, you know, I, I had my first real experience of OCD when I was 19 at Sunderland, putting gigs on at the Royalty on Chester Road, <laughs> pretend, pretending to all my mates that I was all right, um, going home or being behind closed doors, like, you know, having conversations with God, you know, like crazy shit going like, what is happening to me? Um, and I have to admit, and it isn't any sort of like, it isn't supposed to be any sort of, you know, Bono thing, but it's like, I don't want any kids to feel like that. And I do feel like I have achieved, given where I've come from and given what has gone on in my head in my life, I do feel like I've really achieved some amazing things, you know? And like, I do want anyone to know that you can achieve amazing things despite what the uh, odds are as well. In the, um, in the article you talk about, I think it's, you're talking about obviously visibility and the, uh, and the illness itself. And you the artist that you mention, uh, uh, the one particular one is George Ezra. And you yeah. start by saying, you know, I've never been a big fan of his music, Yeah. but it was, and you were boring, saying, you know, it? a bit boring, <laughs> well, isn't it? Me mum loves it. And she might be listening. All right. Mom, mom He's will, brilliant. Mom loves it as well. Mum loves it. <laughs> It's brilliant. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. But um, but it, you were saying like you know, I mean, I can't, I'm paraphrasing. But you'd said something like you know, I wish when I was a teenager, I'd had a kind of OCD icon, you know, oh, or, or idol to look up to. Somebody. Oh, you know how I feel. You know. Oh my it's... god. I mean, it's like so. There's this ill. You know, it's like there will be people watching this right now who, like. Won't even understand what we're talking about. James, because... some, someone just wrote up uh, here. Sorry to interrupt you. Somebody yeah. just wrote here that like um, I have a personality dis- dis- I have a personality disorder, so I understand what you're saying. So carry no, on. Totally, yeah, yeah, totally. Like you know, the idea of even 
I mean, if we were doing this like, you know, 20 years ago, we would have been thinking this was like witchcraft or whatever anyway. But I... like the, the idea of saying that in public like 20 years ago, it was crazy. Like, you know, I spent 10 years in my OCD, like ashamed, you know, like it was like, it was a flaw, but I also didn't understand what it was. So it was like, I guess the, my thing when I read that George Ezra story, I mean, you know, forget about what, you know, forget whether, and this is a sign I have grown up as a music critic, like, forget whether I like George Ezra or not. Who cares? Yeah. Like, that, I almost wanted to cry when I read that new story because I was like, this is illness that no one really understands, not even doctors. It feels like your brain's been turned inside out, that takes so long to get any kind of support for. And there's one of the most famous people in the country going, oh, yeah, I've just found out I've got OCD. Like, that is like, that's she shit, you know? That's like yeah. so empowering. So. Yeah, you know, it's shit that I never had that, but it's a bit, it's amazing for anyone right now. It, it, uh, it, it's a brilliant my, article. Thank you, thank you. It is, and uh, when I, you talk about it, like, being spoken about, OCD being spoken about so flippantly, I remember being, like, um, in a shoe shop, uh, like, the other year, and yeah. there were these two young lasses. This, and this then, is OCD, actually, remembering the location. and the... Uh, It was office on Carnaby Street, okay. and um, there was these two young lasses in there trying on shoes. And then one of them goes to her friend, she's like, I like these ones or these ones. I, 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 I like pink, but like, what do I, I don't even know what I like. I, I'm just like so OCD. And I was like, in my head, I wanted to go, well, firstly, you're grammatically incorrect. Yeah. You, can't, you can't be so obsessive compulsive disorder. You can be so obsessive compulsive. Well, you pulled but... them up on it. <laughs> No, I, in my head. Oh, right, right. <laughs> and I was walking away going, I should have said this, I should have said this. But like you're saying, people talk about the illness so flippantly. And then it, you put it, it's a very short, I'm going to put a link to it if you don't mind after, oh, yeah, this, yeah, totally, yeah. after this conversation. But you, you speak about it so eloquently and you're a real champion for people who suffer from that also. I mean, if I can, if I can plug one thing on my website, there's a, on my website, which, you know, feel free to put a link or whatever, there's a section that I'm building up at the moment called the OCD Chronicles which is like about creative people who've got OCD. So, um, you know, there's people who, um, there's um, a, a, a woman called Danny Jackson, who's like a comedian for like Comedy Central, who, you know, her story with OCD is like unbelievably inspiring. I'm just about to interview, and I can't remember her name, and it's terrible, but the the woman who played Matilda, you know, in Matilda? As in like the, the, the last who was also in the film with the little otter or seal. Have you made that up? No, like the American act, the American Matilda, that one. She's on Twitter and she's so funny. She's like the funniest person on Twitter. Oh, no, I've missed it. I find her. Yeah, no, she's amazing. But she's like, we're just about to speak about it. And, Brilliant. you know, some of her stories that we've sort of shared off the record about her being a little girl on, on the set of Matilda, but not understanding why her brain was working or not working as it should do. You know, so I don't know. You've got to do your bit, haven't you? I think give, you us, do. Give, 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 give us your fucking money, all that, you know. <laughs> your fucking money. James, have you ever, have you ever, have you ever written, and I'm, <laughs> I ask people this and I'm not sure what they're going to answer. I'm pretty sure the answer from you is yes. Because you are, you are kind of known for being quite an outspoken character, which I think is brilliant and I miss in a lot of music journalism. But have you ever given a really scathing review to either an artist or a band and either, either you really regretted it afterwards and just felt like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Like, what was I thinking? Or that artist or band have, like, held a lifelong vendetta against you because of it. I mean, there's no way of answering this without a slightly lengthy ramble. Is that yeah. okay? Fine. Go off okay, and have a look. so, like... <laughs> I mean, I could answer a yes and no question with a lengthy ramble. I think that, like, um, I think I was really, I think I was really confused about what what I wanted to be as a writer when I was younger. younger. Like, even though I always, even though I knew I wanted to be an enemy writer, right? Mm. I was, I think, for a long time, far too long, really. I was sort of playing a part. You know, I kind of, I was pretty funny and I was like quite acerbic, and I do have some, some quite strong opinions, but like. You know, there's that thing, isn't there, where, like, I do think a lot of writers, where it's about going for the jugular and it's about um, not being mean, but it's often it's often when the writing is about them and not actually about the art. 
And I feel like I actually, I'm not really going to get lost in that, but actually you saying there, like you're going, oh, you know, you're someone who's known for, a bit opinion, for being a bit opinionated. I can't really argue with that because, you know, like my best friends at university regularly, you know, recount stories of me threatening to go home because someone was playing the Beatles on the stereo, you know? Like, I was that person, like... <laughs> you little do, shit. do you know what I mean? Like, I lived it, you know? But, like, I don't really like that person. And I sort of feel that when I actually, you know, and there's, there's writers who kind of help me with it, not, like, kind of sit me down and go, right, I'm going to teach you the way the music's doing this. But, like, you know, Pat Long, you know, God rest his soul, who's a writer who's not around anymore, who was, like, a, you know, a real help to me enemy. And he, he kind of, like, really taught me about writing in such a way that you know there was flair and there was colour there but it was about almost like holding up a magnifying glass to what you were writing about rather than you know kind of directing the sun into the magnifying glass to scorch it you know like some I can't remember the last time I read a takedown of an act by another writer where I went that's harsh I, I can't remember the last time I laughed about it, you know, like maybe when I was a kid, you know, like your Mr. Agreeables and the Melody Makers. And I, I think I probably found that stuff really funny and probably thought the music journalism should be a little bit like going to war. But I'm not yeah. sure I really feel like that anymore. Like, however. <laughs> yeah, get, here we go. Thank you. There I'm, are, the, I'm nodding politely, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. however, yes. I mean, there, there are, there's like loads and it's, and it's, a nightmare because you know I remember writing some crappy things about Block Party back in the day and then you know lo and behold you know 15 years on you know one of my you know some of my friends start working with Block Party yeah and that's that's fun isn't it you know so then am I right to go to their after show and then if we get on is that okay and you know there's Fine. all that kind of weird stuff you know I mean the one is you know C6 Steve yes yeah, he, I mean, he. I think he. I think he'd kill me. Like, I tell. I tell you what it is, right? Is when I first started writing for Metal Hammer, there's a writer called Ian Winwood, and he sent me to do this band called Disturbed. You know, waka waka down with the sickness. Du, 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 du. You know that band? Yes. I'm gonna have to give you a bit of a crash course on on metal. Yeah, you really. My boyfriend said that too. Yes, you do. Carry on. Have, have you been to Trillions? Trillions rock bar, I hmm. loads. Yeah, of course you have. So therefore, you know, you should know a bit more than you're laying on it. Really. I only went there because I fancied some lads that went. And I was like, yeah, I love this film. I mean, it's, a, it's open a bit longer than anywhere, anywhere else as well. I just think it's a lot of people. <laughs> uh, no, like um, this Ian Winwood who gave me my first work for Metal Hammer. He sent me to New Jersey to do this band Disturbed. They were like a massive new metal band. And he... Um, he was like, look, I was going to do this trip. I really like New Jersey. <laughs> But I can't do it because the singer wants to, like, kill me. Um, <laughs> and I got out there and I sat down and the singer brought, like, a wolfhound in the interview with him. This is my first time in America. I was like, is this normal? I mean, I found out, I'm, I'm qualifying it's a wolfhound, but I didn't. I thought it was a wolf at the time. This anecdote has been repeated for years as a wolf, but I think it was. <laughs> and he um, said to me, he said, do you know Ian Winwood? And I was like, yeah, he's my editor. Uh, he was going, yeah, you tell him, uh, if I ever see him, I will slit his throat and I'll happily do the time. And I remember being like, oh, my God. And going back and telling Ian Winwood this, and, yeah. him being, and him being, like, so delighted by it. You know, so like, oh, you know, I've, I've got him, you know, I touched the right buttons. And I have to say, I just never wanted to be that person. I probably did want to be that person kind of like when I was a teenager or even when, like, you know, first couple of months of the enemy. And even now, find... That I sometimes I'm still defending myself because that's how I was. But I don't. I, I, I want to be someone that you know. When you read this stuff, they go, "Oh, there, there was there was insight there." That yeah. sounds lame, really. Like no, no, but, that, that that sounds. Just do you know what fine. I mean? I yeah. understand. Someone actually, someone down in the comments mentioned Neil Kakani, who is I think uh, a real example of someone who does it very well, mainly because. There is no like separation of church and state. Like he's just a very funny, angry man who has reason to be angry about things yeah. because he's an Asian man working in a industry of posh white guys. Yes. Like, so it's really sincere. Um, but you know, anyway. No, but I kind of, I, there's a there's a bit of me. I mean, there was like a, that that very. Um, 
that voice that NMA had, that kind of sarcastic type of journalism, and I really hated it. Um, and I'm not trying to sound all saccharine, like, just be kind. But, like, you know, at least be funny. If you're going to be mean, be funny about it and make it witty. And I kind of miss that in music journalism. And the only place I find to satisfy that kind of voice is with Jay Rayner. But that's with cooking, <clears throat> him, like, him reviewing restaurants. And Jay Rayner is just so funny. And he can be really scathing about a place. But it's hilarious. And it's not just kind of mean. You know, he's really well-versed. And I, I do... I, I've, I can't cite which ones of yours I've read before, but of, of, of this example I'm trying to find, but you did have, you're a good writer and you are very funny. You're oh, very, very funny. Thank and um, when you have done you're it... Good at, you're good at the songs. Oh, yeah, oh, sometimes. But, um, but you, did it, you did it very, very well. But I wonder, going from like, going from the enemy... And then Kerrang, I mean, bloody hell. Being the editor of Kerrang, I mean, for you, that must have been... How did that feel when you got that job? Was that, like, your dream job? Was it, like, right, where do I go? This is, this is it. No, not really. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> like, it was... Next. Um, it was... Um, I mean, it's that weird thing, isn't it? It's like when people go, oh, you know, you ended up having your dream job. Like, yeah. well, I didn't really, because I really wanted to make puppets for Jim Henson. You know, that... <gasps> Me too. You're joking, right? So that's like my dream job. That's right? my no? that's my dream job. <laughs> like... Hi ho, come with the frog here. Report to your life on Sesame Street. You know what I mean? Yeah, I met, totally. Actually, I met someone. I met someone years ago who uh, used to work at Jim Henson Factory when it, there was an office in Camden. Uh, God, I can't remember where it is. In, where it is in Camden? Like almost like where the Black Art is. I think that's where it used to be. Yeah, it was. Uh, he had some amazing stories. Anyway, um, um, I'll ring you after. Um, <laughs> oh, so cool! Yeah, that's no. the, I mean, that's everybody's dream job. It, it was a bit like like a lot of things in my life. Like the whole enemy thing was like, you know, like I loved it and everything. But it was like there was lots of other things I loved. You know, like I loved, you know, comic books and there were lots of other things I kind of wanted to be. But it was like when I said to my parents or even you know teachers at school, oh, I want to be a music journalist, write for the enemy. The first thing they did was go like, what? And then when you explained it to them, they were a bit like, that's not what people from Armthorpe Doncaster do. You know, like, it was like that. Like, the pits had only closed, like, six years prior, you know. So, you know, my parents, even now, yeah. who, my parents who are amazingly supportive, but when I was younger, they were always just, you know, turn that stereo off, put that guitar down, you're not going out tonight. They really were, and I think they were just frightened because they were like, no one from where we live is getting a job like you're talking and dressing and becoming this person we don't understand who they, who they are, you know? So I think that, like, you know, the idea of me being what I really wanted to be, which is, like, making puppets of monsters, just would have, like, made the heads explode, you know? So yeah. th it became almost like, oh, I want to be a music journalist, I'm going to stick with that, you know? Yeah. Anyway, I can't remember what I'm wafting on about. Yes, yeah, so I guess that when I get to Kerrang, I really wanted to be the editor of Kerrang!, I really, really wanted to be there, Kerrang. But I think it was more because I had been for the job and hadn't got it before. Yeah. Like, I'd been for the job and it was a really weird kind of gross process where, like, everyone in the music industry knew who'd gone for it. And, you know, there'd be people ringing you up and going, um, it's down to the last two. And you'd be a bit like, oh, God, you know, like, it was weird. And I didn't get it. And I was crushed. And then... Uh, Towards the end of being an enemy, they knew I'd been for this other job, which didn't look great. Um, <laughs> kind of going into work with my tail between my legs. And and also just my OCD, man. It was just, like I say, it was out of control. So it was like, when I got the Quran job, it was like, this is almost the only thing that's going to kind of get me right. Yeah. And that sounds weird, but like... No, I, get, I understand. Yeah. I understand. But, but, then, but then again, the thing that was weird about Quran was like, I was always like... You know, I always felt, I always felt like a bit sort of behind enemy lines a little bit, you know, there wasn't. Yeah, because you're the boss, because you're the editor. Yeah, but there was also a little bit of like, there was a little bit like, who's this indie knobhead? Right. You know, um, and there was a bit, I remember once, like, you know, I'm in the office and, Everyone's listening to like Slipknot or whatever, you know, and 
and the, I had my earphones on. I was listening to Teenage Fan Club, which is whatever, you know, like it's a long day, you know, like man can't live on slip not alone. And someone yeah. accidentally kind of hooked this, the headphones out of the back of the computer. And all of a sudden you could just hear like, la, 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 coming from my computer. And everyone just looked at me like, oh, you're a fraud, aren't you? What was it? Like Teenage Fan Club. But it was oh, like, Teenage you know, like really kind of like lovely, like jangly guitars and stuff. So well, it, could have, it could have been worse. It could have been Bell and Sebastian. You're the secret, yeah, no. dirty yeah. pleasure. Yeah, so good. Um, I'll tell you what I was just thinking, though. You were saying about... Um, uh, no, you, had, you said something that was good. I'll come back to it if I remember. I can't remember what it was. Well, I mean, going from... So going from, like, anime and then the other we had metal one I didn't ask, that one, yeah. and then Kerrang. And then recently, obviously, going from staff jobs to freelancing. And then my looking up, like, things you've been up to recently. You've been writing for the, you write for the Guardian. Hmm, well, sounds like quite a lot, but it's, yeah. you know, how is that? I mean, you you know, you're interviewing people like the likes of Rufus Wainwright and, yeah. and, and things handsome. like, like ha- handsome. Yeah, very handsome. He's got, I sat next to him in the theatre a few weeks ago. Well, not a few, a few months ago now. Go and smells delicious. Um, well, he was, he was my last... Uh, so basically, like, if the world never recomes, it never recovers from where we're at. Yeah. Uh, you will be the last gig that I saw, and he will be the last interview I did in person. Rain and heavyweight champion. Yeah, not bad though. I think you know. People <laughs> have to go out on them too. Like. Um, oh, I was like, but that's. I mean, I, I just find it like because it's a real departure from, you know, the different voices, aren't they? You know, from NMA to Kerrang to the Guardian. And is that, I mean, that's kind of like, is that also reflecting on like on, on your growth, like age wise, you know, like um, I was this age and I could say this and then, and actually now I'm a, I'm a grown up and I write for the Guardian and I write like this. Is it, does it feel strange or do you feel like you have to hone in kind of what you um, want? To say? I don't know. I mean, I can't think of very much, I can't think of much, um, you know, I mean, I've been writing for The Independent quite a lot, I'm writing for The Guardian, yeah. and I did, I did some stuff like The Express the other week. And, like, mm. I, that stuff's amazing because it's, like, you know, I, it's just really amazing for my confidence, you know, because, like, I really was that kid that, you know, that wasn't expected of. And, like, I, I find that when you have that experience, those experiences formatively in life, you've got to stop banging on about them because, you know, I'm almost 40, you know, it's, like, a lot's happened since I was a kid, but... It is hard to lose them as well. So there is that thing of, you know, like my parents-in-law, for example, like, you know, they are so delighted when they pick up a copy of The Observer and I've written something for it, you know. And it's, exactly. it's, it's a real buzz. But also, like, I have to say, this is a combination of... This is a combination of OCD, of, like, feeling a little bit like when I started off being a writer, I wasn't really being true to myself. Yeah. Like, um, spending quite a while to try and find my own voice etc etc like i'm so insecure about that stuff as well you know like i have never there was probably there was probably a run at you know karang was different because i was like the boss but there was probably a run at enemy where i really felt like they're kind of in the engine room of it and you know important so to speak but like when when i go to the guardian i'm like I mean, it's just it's just like very grown up. This is weird, like, like this weird, like degrees of like imposter syndrome and yeah. crazy OCD worries, and and it's not that I'm like going, oh, I can't write for these people because I'm like, you should just turn over the newspaper to me. Like, I'll I'll write it all. It's fine, but it there is like a massive, you know, like I would love to write for Q. Like I've done some writing for Q, right? But like I've dreamt of writing for Q for years, and like I will have. Come on, Ted Kessler. Well, you, you said it, but like I'm I will have like, I'm really, interviewing him. I saw him. I have really good Q ideas, and I'll just sit there hovering over the computer, going, "Yeah, but it's Q, isn't it?" And then you go, "Yeah, but I've been doing this for twenty years. Like I've written for Rolling Stone," and you're like, "Yeah, but you know, I don't know. It's just weird, man. I just wish." Is, is that just self, is that just like crippling self doubt? Which no, I'm I sure that people. I think there's definitely to a de- there's definitely the OCD thing, right? Is, of without course. Doubt. 
because that complicates every thought I've, I have. Yeah. But I also think there's, there's, there is a class thing in there as well. And it's not that, you know, it's not that, it's not that there aren't other working class people at the at newspapers and magazines. But I do think the one thing I really felt when I moved to the moved to London when I was twenty five and started at the NME was like my stories were just so different to anyone else's. And it was like that's the real thing that I think people don't get about whatever still exists of a class system in Britain is that it it's basically the difference between having confidence and not having confidence. You know, yeah. I would sit next to someone and they'd be like, well, I'm going to do this. Yeah. But I had like 10 reasons why I couldn't do it before I tried to do it. Yeah. You know? Um, but then again, honestly, there's part of me that goes, you know, you're a white dude. Shut up. You know, like, you don't have half the, um, you don't have half of the, um, blah, 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 than other people do. But anyway. It's this- all right. I'm off Pakistani Geordie female and I'm allowing you to have it. It's fine. I'm giving oh, yeah. you fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, I mean, we're talking about confidence and, you know, and a lack of and things like that. When it comes to like, I just, I, oh, I, 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 when it comes to certain interviews, are there, are there like, there's, there's certain people you must interview where you're just like, you're shit scared before you go into it because it's like, this is Edwin Collins or this is, you know, whoever it is. I, uh, is is there anybody? I mean, there's a whole plethora of people you haven't interviewed who are massive names, and you somehow get by, and you still, despite yeah. your illness, yeah. you bloody do it. Yeah. But it, it, but aside from, I don't know, maybe included as well, to be honest. But aside from that, is there an artist where you just go like, nah, I can't do that. Yeah. No it's, way. It's Either because cool. they're awful and you don't want to do it, or because like I cannot talk to that person. I admire them so much. Nah. So, I mean, like, like anyone, like any northern boy who was 15 in 1995, like, I, I loved Oasis. I've never done Oasis, never never done Noel or Liam. And it was because, and I really regret it, because it would have been a right laugh. But You had the opportunity, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> like, um, I had a friend that knew, I had a friend that was sort of, like, on, on the inner, you know, sort of knew the inner machinations of the band. And he would basically tell me what Liam and Noel would call journalists. You know, like, this journalist, they had a nickname for them. You know, so... Can you give us an example? uh, Like, they were just... I mean, they were funny, but they weren't nice. And I'd just be like, I'm I'm an overweight, bald, bearded man. You know, like, I I, I, I can't deal with this. I don't want them to be horrible to me, you know, like... What else they got? Well, there's some... (laughs) There's sometimes those things that you just want to leave. You want to leave in the realm of fandom, don't you? You know. But, yeah, I didn't do Marky me. Smith because I just was like, I, I was like, I don't think I'm. I don't think I don't think I'm clever or as, or will ever be drunk enough to do this properly. You know. Like, oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so I, and I love the fall as well. I mean, it's like I have, I, you know, I have interviewed people where like I've come away and I've gone, oh, they were rubbish. Not really, like, as in, like, oh, that was a car crash, I can't listen to anymore. Well, yeah, no, I mean, has there been, like, times you've interviewed people and you've, like, you've really, I mean, you've built it up so much, like, it's this person, I'm expect, and then they just haven't delivered, and you're like, you know what, they were, oh, how was it, was it, how was it, I know you were dead excited about, actually, it was pretty boring, it's a bit uh, dull. I mean, the more, the more I do movie people, the more I just think that it's so boring. That's not music, not allowed. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> there's a slight degree of relevance there no like um yeah. but no, i guess i guess it has made me really grateful for musicians though because mm-hmm. like you know musicians are i mean i, I think I, I i don't know how anyone i don't like there's nothing in it for musicians other than loving music like no one's making any money like yeah, yeah. you get to, you get to see a bit of the world but it's like the crap bit of the world it's just like dressing rooms and stuff like Shame. the only reason to be a musician is to like love music. Like in this day and age, that's amazing. And like because of that, I think that musicians are asked like to do so much that's you feeling good about yourself when you say this. No, I'm. I'm. Oh, no, I'm listening to you saying it and like loving the fact that a music journalist is saying that because part of the reason I wanted to do this series was I guess it's a mutual respect and it's it's being able to say it to you lot that I really appreciate you. 
and I really I value what you do as an art. And I mean, to that, hear to hear you say that, it's like you know, it's it's a mutual appreciation. And that's the that's the beauty of of this. I think. Yeah, I mean, I I I mean, it's going slightly off topic here, but I think that you know, it's probably the difference between. I mean, you know, like, I sometimes feel like the music press is a little bit like, you know, at this juncture, it's almost like it's a wasteland, you know? It's like yeah. the, you know, so many of the big magazines have fallen, like so many big magazines are struggling to carry on. There's so many people who would just be, who would maybe be listening to this going, a magazine, you know, like there's no money in it. Yeah. Like, it's a, a nightmare. But I tell you what, it's like when it goes, if it goes, like music will be worse for it because I've always felt like with music journalism that or music writing that without it like music's just sound like punk doesn't exist without the music press like it's just people making a racket like um indie music isn't like an ideology it's just like poor people making music on a budget like the music press is what gives everything context and it, it what makes things exciting and I think the one of the differences that I found within my time working for the music press is that I kind of came in on the back end. I remember going to this playback of um, a Meatloaf record. It was like Banner Hill 3, right? Yes! I went and uh, a friend of mine who'd been a journalist for years before me, you know, much more experienced than me, was like, hey, come to this, be right, laugh. And we went, and there was like zombies serving drinks, and there was like, <laughs> there was like a when uh, there was money in the music industry. There was like a Harley, oh. Dav a Harley Davidson that crashed on a table of real food. You what? know, almost like it had still gone through a window. There was like animatronic dead crows, and I remember being like, "Here, yeah, man, I I've arrived." And I tell you what, right? That was like, that was like you know, eighteen years ago, and there was never another time like that. This is what I mean. I mean, I was definitely born too late when the CD was invented and essentially record labels had the license to mint money. And you hear of all these extravagant parties, playback parties and all the rest of it. And I love, I love hearing this. You oh, know, man, and like, it was, it, you I, could I, be flown to um, New Jersey and things like that, you know? <laughs> well, no, I, to be honest, I've still done okay for the trips. Like, um, I mean, you know, like, again, if the world never returns to normal, my last trip was to San Francisco to do Green Day in January, which was a bit of a 15-year-old, you know. I bet you I, I, I would have been happy with that. But, like, I don't know, man. No, like, so, you know, I went to a uh, a Foo Fighters play back the other week, and they had food there, right? And it was KFC. Now, that's fine. I mean, it's not, I don't eat KFC, but, like. Rubbish. No, but it's that it's like KFC having a laugh, like Meatloaf had animatronic crows. Yeah, you, exactly. You know, zombies serving volivons, you know. So that's where it's gone. <laughs> but what I do well, think I do think when you meet um I do think when you meet like the younger music journalists, like they they they're in it for exactly the right reasons. Yeah. You know, they're not they're not in it for like a laugh because it's not paying their rent, you know? It's like they're in it because they love music. Yep. Sometimes I think that can be a bit earnest. Sometimes I think that the best ones, they have jokes as well, you know? So whilst the music press is in, like, a terrible state, I actually think that the people who are, like, manning it uh, are, are, do, are doing it for the right reasons, and they're great. Yeah. You know? Well, unfortunately, I'm being paid for it. We've only got... Because of these bloody limitations we have on Instagram Live. It's an yeah, hour it's long. Right. And we both, we both started on time. I've got five minutes left. I want to ask you, um, have you got like, and I asked John Doran this and I asked Miranda Sawyer this, do you have like um, a bunch of questions, like a bank of a bunch of questions which are like unique to you that you pull out if it's like an interview is going to shake or just because you want to shake things up? You know, like, so John Doran asked Damon Albin, you know, do you pray? Miranda Sawyer will ask people out the blue, what posters did you have on your wall as a kid? Do you have any like that? I mean, I just think that it's the same. I just think I do the same interview with everyone. Really? Like, it's just, like, it's all based on, not based on, because it sounds like I'm, like, it's a conscious thing, but there's so much of thera my therapy in my interviews. You know, like, there's so much of, I guess it's the, type of questions like how did that 
like how did that make you feel how do you feel about that like it's never like they're just the kind of questions that you get asked in therapy is, is that since to... be, is that since being diagnosed and is that that's in your later years of music journalism though right i just think i've always been a bit like that anyway you know yeah. like i think that you know I, it's I've, I've been doing fanzines when i was 15 and i went back and i was like um sorting out something in like my office so i have an office at home and i've sorted some stuff out and found some of my old fanzines and i was reading them and i was going like you know right off the bat you were like you you, you wanted to get deep you know it wasn't what's your favorite color and you know what's your favorite breath cheese although there is a, there is a time and a place for that you know like as, as, as someone who loved smash it's growing up there were things like that i loved knowing you know but I oh, always, yeah, yeah, I always, right. I always wanted to, uh, yeah, I always wanted to get deep. But I'm like my mates, you know what I mean? Like I'm a nightmare. It's like, how do you feel about this? No, it's really, it's really refreshing. A friend of mine coined this phrase, um, the sad lads club, and yeah. it's like it's a place where we can all talk. And he started a WhatsApp group called the Sad Lads Club. Oh, and I think he's, I will do, he's amazing. He's called Ross Lewis. He's an amazing oh, tour Ross manager. Lewis. Ross Lewis. Yeah. Man. He's the very best. Now what was the band you used to be in? Oh, I can't bloody remember. But he's he tour manages like a lot of bands. Sound, he's like sound man to the stars now. Though, yes. Isn't and yeah. he's the nicest person ever. I talked to him about mental health. I talked to you about mental health also. And while we're wrapping up right now, I want to, I, I really want to just take a moment to, to properly thank you. And it really, it, it sent like shivers down my spine reading your article um, about, um, you know, the one which is called How a New Generation of Musicians Are Confronting OCD. I think it's, I mean, brave is the wrong word, but it's, it's so beautiful of you as a music journalist who's normally documenting from the other side. You've really flipped it on its head there. And it's really beautiful to speak about your experience so eloquently and talk about this lack of visibility within the music industry. You're really, um, you're really championing people suffering from that particular illness, not just the underdog, but people suffering from that illness. So th you know thanks, what? James, and just for all your work. Cheers. Thanks, mate. The last thing I'll say... One minute think, fifty. Go. I think that, like, one of the things that people forget about music journalism is that actually writing about music is quite boring. But, like people aren't boring you know so it's like ultimately writing about people is amazing and limitless and boundless and i think that that's always been that's always been kind of why i wanted to do it like the music was kind of what hooked me in like I came for the music i stayed for the people <laughs> right i'm gonna i'm gonna stop my guinea pigs from killing each other now but it's been very nice to do this yeah mate thank you i really appreciate your time and I want to hear more in the future. Maybe we could do a part two at some point. I want more of these debauched daft stories about meatloaf and the rest of it. In the meantime, I'm going to post a, a link to your article about OCD and do a it. link to your website, which also has your new series, which is called the OCD Stories. OCD is it? Chronicles, yeah. OCD Chronicles. Oh, and should join, people should join Spook, which is my mailing list about uh, the paranormal and true crime and all manner of weird stuff as well. There's a Brilliant. website, so... I'm in. Thanks so much, buddy. And thanks to everyone for listening as well. Love to the guinea pigs. Love to cat. Thank you for listening. Toronto.